Combat Leader is a new war game published by Minton Games, a small independent company. As you can see, uh, component-wise, the game is not particularly fancy. It comes in a Ziploc bag. The components, as you will see, are pretty uh, simple, pretty low-key. But you do not purchase games from these small companies because you want gorgeous components, but because you're interested in the design. Talking about the design, Combat Leader is a game that uh, depicts uh, man-to-man -man combat in World War II on the Eastern Front. So you have uh, counters representing individual uh, individual soldiers uh, on the Eastern Front, Germans versus Russians. It is a two-player game um, that can be played solo two. It just requires one or two small adjustments, but nothing too drastic. It is also a pretty basic game. It could work as an entryway um, war game, even though not maybe the best that there is out there for reasons that I will explain later in the uh, review. It is not very long to play. It comes with a bunch of scenarios that also have variants, so that is good. There definitely is replay value in those. And considering that the game doesn't take too long to set up or to play and that it is so portable, this is a war game that could work well in a lunch break. It could be the proverbial lunch break game. Anyhow, let's take a closer look at the design. The game includes a short rollbook. It is only 12 pages, uh, but the last page is designer's notes. Uh, there are a lot of examples, and really from page 8 on, it is mainly advanced optional rules. So the basic rules are really short, and they also include some pretty lengthy examples. It's probably like three pages of rules total. You have two paper maps. Here they are. This is one. And this is the other, pretty spartan in the design, but uh, effective and functional nevertheless. You have uh, some markers, such as these ones, and counters representing combat units. They are uncut. You will find two sheets of uncut markers. We'll have a closer look in a minute. And you have to cut them yourself. They are also pretty thin, as you can see. And since you had to stack them sometimes, that's a little irritating. Not terribly so, but not the best thing. Player aids. Two player aids uh, with a lot of information. They're very useful. They're double-sided, so if you're playing with two players, each player gets their own. Or if you're playing the game side like me, you can stick both in your uh, computer keyboard. One facing one side, one the other, so you have both sides available at all times. The game also has some scenario cards, very useful, three of them, double-sided, that means six scenarios with the description of the situation, setup instructions, victory conditions, game length, and also, interesting enough, some variations so that you can tweak each scenario to increase the replay value of the game. Some things that do not come with the game are a six-sided die that you need to add for yourself a deck of regular cards or regular playing cards also um, the scenarios require you to keep track of the turns that are being played but there is no turn track on the board so I made my own beautiful elegant turn track and I track turns with a military meeple here not included with the game even though the player aids are good, there is still some relevant information that I like to have at hand as I play the game, and it is only buried in the rulebook, so I also made my own beautiful high-tech player aid here, especially for the uh, sequence of various phases during a turn. Now, how does the game play? You choose a scenario, you set up uh, following the setup instructions, and you will place your units on the board based on the units that you have and the instructions that you receive. Units, let's have a closer look. There are some pieces of information printed on each counter and some that I wrote. I'll explain later how that happened and why that happened. The number that you see there is the fire factor the, of the unit, of the of the man. These are, uh, this is man-to-man -man combat. Each counter represents a single man. So here you have the fire factor, the fire skill of that soldier. The number printed up there is morale. There may be an indication regarding the weapon. That can be, be a uh, machine pistol or a light machine gun. If there is no indication of a weapon, then it is a 
it is a rifle there can be there may be a diamond symbol that indicates a soldier that is particularly good at melee leader or assistant leader and leaders can uh, lend benefits to units that are around them that are stacked with them and also generally to the flow of the game as i will, share, I will explain later as you can see, it did write some numbers on each corner, which is unusual for me, but the point is that each uh, each soldier also has a melee value, a melee value which you need to use during the game, you need to add the melee value of all of the people that are involved in a melee, but the melee value of your soldiers is not printed on their counter. The melee is the sum of morale, of fire factor plus morale, then there's a plus two if the soldier is using a um, machine pistol and or a plus two if there is a diamond symbol. Suppose that these five people are attacking to get in a melee, you would have to calculate all that for each soldier. And considering that it is a sum of information that is all available on the counter, I don't understand why they didn't simply print it on the counter. So I decided to do that for myself. I know this way the counters look a little less nice, but I have all the information that I need and that facilitates gameplay vastly. So as you can see here, 2 and 5 is 7, plus 2 for the machine pistol, that's a 9. The beginning of each phase, player 1, and by default player 1 is the German player, player 1 goes. When it is your phase to activate your units, you choose a hex on the board and you activate all the units that are in the hex. Then you activate all the units to move or to fire. This is the standard game, one of the advanced rules says that when you activate a hex, you can choose to move everybody or fire with everybody or move with some and fire with somebody else uh, so that you have more flexibility i suggest to use the advanced rule as the standard rule otherwise the the, the standard rule is pretty rigid i like the uh, opportunity the possibility of firing with somebody and somebody moves away there is more variety in the actions that you can perform that way so you activate a unit and or oh, better a hex then you activate the units when you activate units for movement, you simply move them. They do not have to stay together. They can move in different directions and in different hexes. But remember that next time that you activate your units, you still activate a single hex. So concentration is useful. And you move um, spending movement points. Uh, regular soldiers have three movement points. Leaders have four. And the regular soldiers have four when they're stacked with leaders that are leading them at different types of terrain cost a different amounts of movement points during your movement or more appropriately i should say at the end of your movement you may enter an hex containing enemy units when you do that your movement is over and you have to resolve melee to resolve melee you look at the melee table well first you add together all of the uh, melee factors of the attackers that of the defender you combine them in a ratio in an odd ratio and that in that way you find the line that you will use on the melee table then you draw a card from a standard deck of playing cards and then you cross reference well you read the odds column uh, and you look for the um, for the area that indicates the uh, card that you just drew. My words got jumbled in my head, that sounded weird. So if I drew a 2 and I have odds that are 3, 2, 2, then I look at this column here. If I drew a 5, it would be this one. And then you say, I know this table is organized a little differently from um, the way most combat tables are organized. That's why I got confused. And then you look at the results. The results of melee are pretty brutal. Uh, you can have all of the attackers killed in action. And look at this, with a 1 to 1 odds, uh, with an ace or a 2, everybody's gone. And sometimes that may mean a big chunk of your, of your troops. So melee combat can be pretty dangerous. DE, all defending men are killed in action, exchange, one attacker is killed in action, the rest must retreat, same as one, but with two, DR1 and DR2, same as AR1 and AR2, but for the defender. 
So that's how you resolve melee. It's pretty simple. Fire combat. If you activate the units in a hex to fire, then you have to resolve fire combat, which is a little more involved than melee combat. Each man that is firing fires individually. You have to resolve each attack individually. First, you determine if there is a line of sight from the firing hex to the target hex. Then you have to calculate range. Now, range is not just based on the number of hex, but also on the type of terrain. Let's say that each hex is worth a certain number of range points. So to, that means that certain types of terrain are easy to see through and they affect the range in different ways. For example, when you're calculating the line of sight, the distance between the fire and the target, uh, you look at the range point value section. For each clear hex that the line of sight crosses, then you're quote unquote spending a range point. If you're going to brush or orchard is one, into woods is two, uh, X containing a building, the same as the X, but machine gun firing through or into clear hexes, the cost is 0 0.5. So for each weapon, you have to calculate what the actual range is, so which may be different, it's not just based on the distance, again, it's based on terrain. So for each weapon, you calculate the distance and based on the actual uh, number of quote-unquote range hexes, you see if the number of range hexes corresponds to short, medium or long for that weapon. So a German soldier using a rifle would be using this line here. If at the end of the calculation, the German soldier with this weapon is three quote-unquote range points away from the target, then the, uh, the range is medium. If the soldier with the machine gun is three quote-unquote range points away from the target, then that is short. So each man attacks individually. When you resolve each attack, you calculate the range for that soldier. Then you draw a card from a standard deck of cards. And you look at the result. You check the result on the fire accuracy table. What you're trying to do is simply to see if you hit the target at all. This is just to hit the target, not to determine damage yet. And there are a couple of modifiers that you have to become familiar with. So you draw your card, for example, suppose I just drew a three. And then you add the fire's fire rating, which is that number there. Leader directed fire, bonus of plus one. Target a short range, plus three. Long range, minus two. Minus one if the target is in brush or chart. Plus one if the X contains six or more enemy men. Minus two for woods and or buildings. So once you have the total result, the total number, you look here, it may be a complete miss. It may be a hit with a seven or eight, a hit, but only if the target is in clear or field hex. A, which is accurate, a minus one accurate but with a penalty. If you did manage to hit to get an accurate result, whether with penalty or not, then you look at the casualty table and you roll a die. You roll a die, you may have to apply a minus one. If you had a minus one, you look at the result, which can be maybe no effect, killed in action, but only if the target rolls a die, and depending on the result, the target may be killed or pinned. There's only be pin and a number in which case you check, and if the number in parentheses is higher than the individual target morale rating, which is the number in the top right corner, then if that number is higher than the individual target's rating, the man is pinned. You place a pin marker on the target Suppose this guy here is pinned. We put it right there. And the um, target cannot uh, move or fire. That unit cannot move or fire until it is rallied. So, back to the uh, sequence of the turn. Player 1 activates a hex for movement uh, and possibly melee or fire combat. Player 2 does the same, activates a hex for movement or fire combat. 
Then you have the initiative phase in which you roll a die and you look at the initiative table. It's in the roll book. I simply copied it down here to have it available. And that determines what happens next, which means the next you may have a rally phase in which pinned soldiers get to roll a die and if you roll, they roll equal to or lower than their morale rating, they can get unpinned. That's when pinned soldiers get a chance of getting unpinned. If you don't have the rally phase, then you may have the German bonus phase or less often the Russian bonus phase. There are modifiers based on the possible presence of unpinned leaders in the battlefield. Plus one if there is at least a German unpinned leader on the battlefield. Minus one if there is a Russian unpinned leader on the battlefield. If you receive as a result one of the bonus phases, simply the side that has received the bonus phase can activate another hex and act with the units in that hex. After you had the bonus or rally based on the role that you had here, there is a possible phase reversal. As I said in each scenario, uh, the German player goes first and then the Russian player goes. In this phase, you roll a die. If you roll 1 to 5, nothing happens. The player 1 is still the German player, player 2 is still the Russian player. If you roll a 6, the roll is reversed. That means that starting from the turn that is just beginning, player 1 is the Russian player and player 2 is the German player. And that can be, um, can be reverted again by the roll during this phase. Anyways, this is how a turn work and after you have completed your turn you reshuffle the deck of cards and you're ready to play the next turn and you continue like this until the scenario is over or one of the players has met the victory conditions of the scenario that you're playing. Now I enjoy the game uh, more than I thought I would after reading the rule book. When I was reading the rule book I was really skeptical. Um, I was really not all that excited. So I enjoyed more than I thought I would, but not all that much more. This is not my new favorite entryway war game. There are small uh, elements here and there with the with the production. The turn track is not there, some information is not there. You just have to make some adjustments if you want to facilitate the gameplay like I did here, for example, by writing on the counters. Some of you are more technologically savvy than I am. I, I think that you will be able to redesign your own counters. I don't want to go through the trouble of doing that, also I wouldn't know how to. Uh, but even if I knew, I don't know that this is a game that I'm going to play so many times in the future that I want to have functional as well as attractive components. Um, some elements uh, that are important, actually I didn't mention in the earlier phases of, the, of my review, uh, some counters here represent fake units, I didn't show them in the video, it's simply uh, counters with, that do not have a unit printed on it, they're just a symbol representing a nationality and the word fake written on the counter. If you're playing the standard game, you play with units face down at the beginning of the game, they are revealed during the action and some of those units are fakes. So you can have a little bit of bluffing there, you can try to trick your opponent into going where there isn't really anything interesting, where there isn't really a powerful squad and then you attack the opponent with a large group. Uh, if you're playing the game Soiter, you play with uh, your counters face up without the fakes. That's the way I played it. Uh, I didn't find that that was that big of a problem. You, you miss the bluff factor, but there is enough randomness in the game to really still f or keep things unpredictable. Uh, of course, you plan a little, a little more uh, because you don't have the bluffing factor, but you will be surprised plenty of times. Something that surprised me at the beginning was how ineffective firepower seemed to be. I was firing and firing and firing and sometimes I would miss because of the card and say hooray then. Uh, but then finally you say hooray I, I got a hit. Then I roll and I fail there. So draw, roll, draw. Okay I hit on the draw. I hit on the roll. Wait no I need to roll to see if I hit. Oh okay pinned. There, there are a lot of factors that you really need to position yourself close to the opponent. 
even just some medium cover uh, can have a huge effect on the fight power of the opponent. It's not that easy to get close to your opponent to get short range. But uh, I realized that that um, probably was a conscious decision. It is not simply something that feels like was overlooked, but it's something that is part of a larger design. The idea, as I am kind of like figuring it out, as I imagine, uh, uh, the idea behind the game being is that uh, what you need to do is to get close to your opponent and yes you will uh, work very hard just to pin your opponent it's very hard to eliminate your enemies uh, with, um, just with firepower unless you have a machine gun and you're lucky when you are drawing and then rolling uh, but you're pinning your opponent with one group and then you send in another group to destroy them in melee because each unit that is pinned that it is being engaged in melee has a melee factor of only one no matter what the printed stats are so in a certain way uh, the, the limited firepower and the very brutal a melee combat which is brutal and unpredictable unless you're attacking pinned enemies forces you to play in a certain way forces you to follow a certain procedure pin melee pin melee and uh, there is merit in that there are other games that I enjoy very much like Band of Brothers that also encourages you to do that I don't mind seeing it here I think probably the attempt was to portray that element of tactics uh, in the system it just so happens that it turned out a little clunky a little more procedure procedural than I would like um, it's hard for me to think that there wasn't a way of resolving fight combat that only include the cards or only include uh, the dice most games only kill dice. There are many postcard games out there which everything, movement, activation and combat is resolved uh, using a single deck of standard playing cards. Cards and dice and pins uh, and, and pinning and pinning. It just feels like um, there, is too, too, there are too many steps that you have to take for the game to express its own personality. From an introductory game, uh, um, I expected things to be a little more streamlined. I guess that probably the ambitious idea here was to do something that was playable, could be taught easily and played fast, but still had a good degree of historical uh, of historical resemblance, of historical accuracy. Um, I think maybe um, here the combination between something accessible and the attempt to add detail wasn't as successful as it could have. This is not a terrible game, this is a game that I like more than I thought I would. I just can see how there could have been ways of making it even better. This could have been the ultimate lunch break tactical man-to-man -man, uh, war game. As this is not a bad game, I could probably use it in the future to uh, introduce man-to-man -man combat war games to new players. I do not think that it's this is a game that I would pull out very often from the from the shelf or or from the box. I um, need to start in the box just because of, of the format. So it doesn't stack well on the shelf. Um, it's not bad. It's not bad. I'm not in love with it. Uh, it's okay. I feel like it's a little bit of a missed opportunity. It could have been better. That's uh, um, that's uh, the taste that is left in my mouth after playing Combat Leader by Minden Games. Small Ziploc bag. Give it a try if you're interested in this type of game, this type of combat. Maybe you will warm up to it more than I did. Maybe the procedural aspects uh, uh, you will see more merit and effectiveness than I found in it. As is, didn't mind playing it, but I don't think this game will hit the table very often in the future.